If, as seems likely, a Trump government would attempt to broker or even enforce a, a peace in Ukraine, which was based on territory for peace um, and the suspension or substantial reduction uh, of arms to Ukraine, uh, what would the reaction of the EU be to that? Would the EU try to step into the breach, try to make good the, the, the gap, um, or would they reluctantly acquiesce in what the Americans wanted to propose? Um, and where would the United Kingdom stand in that? Would the United Kingdom be one of those arguing for accepting a, 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 an American encouraged and imposed peace? These, these are very, very deep waters indeed, which I don't think that the, the British government has yet thought about. Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust. And I'm speaking once again to Brendan Donnelly, the director of the Federal Trust, about latest developments in the UK and more widely in relation to Brexit. Brendan, uh, last Thursday, the British government hosted a meeting at Blenheim Palace of a new organisation, the European um, Political Community. Uh, what was the significance of this meeting? Uh, what did it amount to? And, and what does it tell us about where the British government is trying to go in its EU policy? Well, the EPC, um, the European Political Community, is is a, a much broader and more informal gathering than the European Union. So it was really an opportunity for Starmer to make his first acquaintance, uh, first pleasant acquaintance, with a number of his colleagues in, in the EU. Uh, mostly what was discussed was um, general European questions. Uh, and I think it will be much easier in that pleasant environment of Blenheim Palace uh, for a newly elected prime minister of a G7 country to make a good impression um, in the meeting and greeting than to get down to, to formal negotiations. Uh, I think the, the environment was, was quite um, favourable, although one reporter did describe the Blenheim Palace as being the ancestral home of the Duke of Wellington. Um, it yeah. almost made me sympathetic to Michael Gove's insistence on British history being taught as a compulsory subject in school. But it, it was a pleasant occasion, but it, uh, it's no more than a, a first step um, on the road to reconstructing relationships with the European Union. The central feature seems to have been discussions about Ukraine and security and defence. And it does seem that the UK government has a proposal to put forward a defence pact with the EU as being it's the leading edge of its reconciliation policy, that's the way to put it. What is the content of that likely to be? Well, that's very much up in the air. Um, and uh, it's um, been welcomed by the EU representatives precisely on the basis that, that it's so vague and general that it doesn't yet commit anyone to anything. Uh, I, th I think it's uh, appropriate um, that the Blenheim meeting should have talked so much about Ukraine, because it, it's certainly true that Ukraine has brought the United Kingdom and the European Union rather closer in their analysis uh, over the past couple of years. And, and that's a, a good starting point. I think the British government is, is hopeful that this um, uh, starting point of a defence um, pact um, will branch out into other areas such as defence procurement, uh, environmental legislation, uh, artificial intelligence research. Um, and there I think the European Union will be much more cautious because those are elements that are already covered by the, the, the dense legal network of the European Union. Um, and I think they will be very much uh, on the alert for the Europe, for the British um, not to be allowed to do what they regard as cherry picking. Hanging over all questions to do with defence and security in Ukraine, of course, is what is going on in America. And behind European concerns have always been, indeed, the fact that Britain has sought to be closer to America than perhaps it has been to, to Europe, or at any rate, there is this dichotomy between our looking both towards Europe and towards America. And particularly in defence terms, we are very uh, linked to the Americans. How much is this a, a problem? And, and how much will turning a defence pact, if it is able to be done, given that restriction of our American connections, um, going to be for other areas of policy? I mean, we've already seen Starmer has set a number of red lines in his approach to the EU. I mean, can this 
really amount to very much this strategy of using defense as a as a, a lever to to move towards closer relations uh, i think it's uh, an approach that has its limitations and um, for the reasons that i've set out um that uh, uh, if you get beyond the strict remit of defense you're talking about the internal market you're talking about government procurement you're talking about things in which the european union has a specific competence uh, but I think that uh, overshadowing all these potential problems is, is the question of who's going to be the president of the United States um, come the beginning of next year. Because if, if it is Trump, if it is Trump, then a, a number of difficulties come uh, to the fore, even for the defense pact. Um, because uh, if, as seems likely, um, the uh, uh, a Trump government would attempt to broker or even enforce a, a peace in, in, in Ukraine, which was based on territory for peace um, and the suspension or the substantial reduction uh, of arms to Ukraine, uh, what would the reaction of the EU be to that? Would the EU try to step into the breach, try to make good the, the, the gap, um, or would they reluctantly acquiesce in what the Americans want? Wanted to propose. Um, and where would the United Kingdom stand in that? Would the United Kingdom be one of those arguing for accepting a, 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 an American encouraged and imposed peace? The, these are very, very deep waters indeed, which I don't think that the, the British government has yet thought about. What is your guess, though, on, on that? I mean, do you think that the Europeans would be able to take a, uh, an autonomous line towards Ukraine in the absence of American support? Uh, personally, I think they'd like to, but it would be very, very difficult indeed. Um, there are a number of inhibitions, um, um, not least in Germany, um, even in the United Kingdom. Uh, we, we know that the financial pressures under which the Starmer government feels itself um, and has been reluctant to commit fully and immediately to the 2.5 um, um, NATO uh, percent of GDP for, for NATO spending. Um, what I think may happen is that reluctantly, I'm not, by the way, entirely sure that Trump is going to win. And even if he does win, his, his approach to Ukraine may be a little more nuanced than he says it is going to be. But but we have to deal with with the, the extreme possibilities. I, I, I think that Europe will find it very difficult uh, in any anything other than the immediate short term to step into the breach left by the Americans. But I think that if that did happen, that would kickstart uh, um, a, a view in the European Union. Um, we're not going to find ourselves so exposed again. Um, it would be a, an enormous motor for greater defence integration within the European Union um, for making sure that next time they, 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 they weren't um, naked at the conference table, if you like. Um, and I think that that would pose for the United Kingdom a, a very serious um, um, set of, of dilemmas, um, which wouldn't just be in the defence uh, arena. It, it might well be that um, on, in the trade and economic arena, uh, a Trump government um, wanted to offer um, to the United Kingdom uh, rather more favourable terms, uh, trading terms, than it was prepared to offer to the U European Union. Um, and that would be driving a wedge between the United Kingdom and the European Union. But more fundamentally, whether it is Trump or or uh, a Democrat uh, successor, um, Kamala Harris, uh, the direction of American trade policy towards greater protectionism seems to be very well established and unlikely to shift. I mean, it could be that Trump makes that more intensive. Um, but equally, as you say, it is possible to imagine Trump perhaps seeking to offer some special conditions to the UK that it would not be prepared to offer to uh, the EU. So I mean, where does this, this leave the, the, the trade issue specifically? Do you think that uh, the European reaction to uh, American protectionism would be likely to make them more generous towards the UK and more flexible in trying to reintegrate the uh, British market into uh, a European framework? Or would it likely exacerbate that problem? I, I think the, the, the EU um, has a, a, a rather um, <laughs> transactional view of these things. Um, they would say it, it's up to the British 
if the British are prepared to talk, well, perhaps not Turkey, that wouldn't be the, the appropriate um, term to use in, the, in this context. Um, but if the British are prepared to talk seriously about something that's to our reciprocal advantage, we're happy to do it. Um, but they, they can't imagine that, uh, that they can um, sit between the two. They, they either opt for the Americans or they opt for us. And it's up to them to decide which way they do it. Um, and we'll draw the appropriate conclusions. The rise of American protectionism, though, seems to be uh, well established and uh, likely to go um, far further under whatever administration takes over. And this is, of course, colouring attitudes towards trade worldwide. And we are seeing a general retreat from globalisation. A uh, key to this, obviously, is an American confrontation with China. But initially, from a, the point of view of the UK, its impact is surely to reveal that the timing of Brexit in trade terms was um, almost as bad as it could possibly be because it hit the top of the globalization trend, which is now in reverse. We've left our home market in the EU and we've not created another home market. It may be possible to imagine a, an American administration, a Trump administration, offering uh, somewhat more favorable conditions uh, in its protectionist policy towards the UK than it does to the EU. But more fundamentally, the idea that America is going to be able to offer a, a trade deal or one that would be viable from the UK's point of view, that would remotely replace the EU single market is surely a fantasy. And more broadly, yes, the idea that Britain is now free to trade around the world uh, and is going to be uh, benefiting from further globalization. I mean, that is obviously not the case. Globalization is now well, emphatically we, in reverse. We we've thrown all the pieces up in the air um, at a time uh, of even greater instability than we'd realised. Um, it's a it's a Brexit is it's writ large the uh, Liz Truss policy of thinking that you can cut taxes um, and somehow miraculously um, alternatives will present themselves. That's what we've done with Brexit. Um, we've, as you say, um, destroyed our, our, our most important um, continental market, not destroyed, but substantially restricted it um, in the, the vain hope that something will come along instead. Um, and all the auguries are, are very much in, in the opposite direction. Uh, it's ironic that um, both trade and defence seem to be coming to a head um, in a way that will emphasise British um, uh, uh, isolation as a result of Brexit. Um, both of those areas have become much more problematic for the United Kingdom in the past five years um, than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Well, coming back to the defence element of this uh, duopoly of defence and trade, uh, behind the issues of supporting Ukraine or, or not supporting Ukraine, uh, is, of course, the American confrontation with China. Some people see uh, the uh, Ukrainian crisis as being uh, pushed by China, and China's influence over Russia is clearly growing the longer this war continues, uh, particularly economic influence. But where in this general confrontation between America and China, America seeing China as its principal global rival, where does the UK stand in this compared to the EU? Uh, will Britain basically uh, go with the Americans and, and reorientate its strategic perceptions towards the Pacific? I mean, we've seen the deal with Australia, yeah. for example, over submarines. Or, or will it be constrained to recognise that its real security interests are in Europe um, because of Ukraine, but also yeah. simply because of geography? But nobody knows that. Uh, it, it, it's the most... Uh fundamental question of British politics over the next 10 years, or it's part of that fundamental question, um, but nobody really can give an answer. Um, there are enormously uh, powerful arguments, which you've just alluded to, in, in favour of uh, a European connection, uh, a European integration. Um, but there are enormous constraints um, uh, from the British political point of view, uh, because currently, um, the United Kingdom is so much enmeshed um, in the Washington view, in the American 
defense community, in the American defense establishments, the, the spies and the submariners that people always talk about. It's going to be very difficult to disentangle that relationship, even though the, um, the objective circumstances um, point very much towards um, the United Kingdom having no, cho no choice. So it will, it will bobble along on the river, it seems to me, sometimes veering a little more towards one bank and veering a little more towards the other, um, but without any, any agency, uh, because it, it's confronted with two, um, two choices, um, neither of which is, 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 is a congenial one. But how will these dilemmas play out in the domestic political battle in the UK? I mean, is it possible to imagine uh, with perhaps the uh, links to reform developing as the Conservative Party in opposition works out what its future should be, that uh, the right in British politics, conservatism, becomes in some way the American party and that the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats uh, orientate towards being the European party in our politics. And what would that mean, actually, for the nature of our debate it's it's entirely possible although um it would be a rather strange um outcome given that on the right of british politics uh, there's always been a, a a certain amount of suspicion um of of the american association um on the right of the conservative party during the iraq war um there were distinct rumblings um, of, of um going back to enoch powell's suspicion of, of the americans um but it, it might work out that way um i think if it does work out that way um that might not be a bad thing for british politics because to some extent um uh, our difficulties, the United Kingdom's difficulties when we were members of the European Union, was that we couldn't make up our mind whether we were Europeans or Americans or, or transatlantic or mid-Atlantic or, or what we were. Um, I think that if there were a, a, a clearer political choice presented in, to, in this country between an American orientation and a European orientation, A, I think the, the, that choice would be, a, would be a salutary one, and B, from my point of view, I, I think it would be the right one. Uh, I can't believe that particularly under Trump, um, there would be any, any, any significant um, um, movement of British public opinion um, for a closer orientation towards the, the Europe, towards the United States rather than towards the European Union. Well, these are very deep waters and uh, likely to be extremely disruptive in our politics, I would have thought, because um, in some respects, this choice, uh, are we looking West or are we looking East? Are we fundamentally Europeans or are we something else? Uh, are we global or American or whatever? Um, has been a theme in our in our culture for a very long time and potentially a very divisive one. Brendan, many thanks for this. Um, we'll follow these um, issues uh, further in subsequent videos. Thank you very much.